Are, are you done or you finished? I'm done. This is this is jazz. Jazz. <laughs> jazz is bilingual too. You know. Go ahead. She it's like true. to speak to me in Spanish. Soy yo. Ballers, shot callers. Hector, do you have any Latino friends? Barely. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, this is Jasmine. Jasmine, go ahead, introduce yourself. Tell the people what you do, you know, awesome. why you're here today and everything we're about to talk about. Go ahead, so give a, give a brief oh. introduction about your life. So I'm Jasmine. Um, no, talk I'm to me. They don't care about you. They don't care about you. They do it's, care. They don't care. It's it, it's they for don't you. They know me yet, but they'll exactly. come to care. Exactly. Step back. Step back. This is this is our conversation. Oh, this is the A and B. This okay. is A and B. Go ahead. So Jasmine, you know, ya tu sabes. Okay, don't see nothing too much. Go <laughs> From to, Ohio, uh -huh. been in Chicago, eleven years, over a okay. decade. So getting kind of up there. Live in Pilsen, but I've also lived in South Shore, Wicker Park, all over uptown. Uh, uh. And I have a startup. So, yeah, let, let, tell us about that. <laughs> right. So I've raised over six million for it, which is really cool. And it's like a event management technology. Okay. So we help corporations to manage their internal events for their employees. So everything from learning and development to diversity and inclusion, culture, workshop trainings, etc. Okay. So that's what I do. No, tell, you got to go more into that. Okay. How do you one? How do you develop that? Two, how uh -huh. do you raise just six million? Because don't say it like it's that easy and shit. It's definitely not that easy. Okay. So, so, so what? So what came? Well, obviously the the idea had to come before the, the raising of the capital, correct? Right. Right. So how did how did the idea come about? How did you figure out? And then when? What were you doing before your startup? Yeah. So, I actually got my first idea, this idea for my business, by working for someone else. Okay. So anytime people come to me and they say they want to start a business, should I quit my job? I'm like, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. You should not quit your job. Because my company that I was at work at Ernst & Young, I was a consultant there. Okay. But I also led like our volunteer initiatives. I like led up our black professional network. Okay. And that's when I was like, this is too hard. What I'm is... doing too much work to put together these events. So, uh, okay. I was like using email. I was using like, calendar, survey tools. Oh, okay, okay. Like a million and five tools. I was like, why can't we just put this in one place? Mm. Make everyone's life easier. More efficient. Exactly. Okay. So like a one-stop shop. Okay. So that's where I got the idea was actually working for somebody else. Okay. Um, okay, so you got the idea of working for somebody else. How old were you when you came up with this idea? Or when wow, you... I was like 22. You at 22? I was like 22, 23, yeah. Okay. I was pretty young. Okay. And it took like a couple years for me to be able to launch it. But I left working at Ernst & Young, and I went to work at this nonprofit. Okay. And I was actually helping students on the south and west sides of Chicago to create their own businesses. Okay. Which was dope. I love kids, okay? Uh, use, the, uh, use the black plate. Oh, the black, okay. Okay. And in helping them create their own companies. And that was you working for the non-for-profit? Right. Okay. And be their own bosses, I was like, I could do this too. It's really inspiring when you work with kids because they believe and know they could do anything, that okay. they're capable. So while I was at the nonprofit, that's when I launched kind of like the first version of the business. Okay. So where does the six million come in? Or how does that how does that work? Well, I robbed the bank first. I believe you. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, hey, just tell the police. Bank robber over Go ahead, here. Yeah, tell the police anything. Right, Go ahead. Right. See? So um, raising money is hard. Okay. Definitely raising money in Chicago. Okay. In 2020. Um, wait, so wait, so what year did you launch your business? 2018 was when I launched my first business, but then we pivoted okay. in like 2019 going into 2020. Okay. And how old were you at 20 in 2018? How old was I in 2018? These years all meshed together. Yeah, come on, man. Math. <laughs> I was born in 90, so how old was I? Oh, 28. Okay, thanks. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so at that point, when we were like, like when, when you're looking at venture capital raises okay. for black founders in Chicago, in 2020, an article came out, and you know how many founders that were black that they said had raised over a million dollars at that Zero. time? Nine. Nine, okay. Still not a lot, yeah, nine, yeah. right? And for women, it was like maybe three on three. that list. Okay. So at that time, we had just raised a million and a half, making us number 10. Okay, so go ahead. How do you, what, what does that process look like? How do you even know how to do that, like, yeah. go ahead. So it's like a little controversial when you talk about 
Chicago Tech as a black person to raise in capital. Okay. So I had two lady friends, one a black woman, the other she's a Latina woman, and they had raised before me. Okay. And I came to them like, yo, like, how'd you, how'd you do it? I'm having such a hard time. And I had worked at 1871 as an intern. I knew all the VCs. I knew all the people with money, but we weren't able to get a dime. I did all the programs. But you had, but you like applied for all the programs, exactly. what you're saying, and didn't get nothing. Right. We okay. were over mentored and underfunded, like a lot mm. of black founders are. Okay. So I went to them and they were like, you either have to find investors on the coast okay. in SF New York or you have to leave Chicago. Mm, okay. And me being from the Midwest, like my family's in the Midwest, I never have lived anywhere else. Right. But what we did was we got some funding from a program out in New York, moved. I moved to New York. Okay. And when was this? That was back in 2018 going 20. into 2019. So okay. I lived in New York for over a year and that's how we were able to raise our first million and a half. So you had to move to New York first or you just applied for the program or like how did that? We applied, got in and then picked up and moved our entire life. You had to lives. pick it up. Yeah. You okay. had to pick up and move. Physically, oh, wow. you had to be in New York. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was but like. So, so what was the difference? Wow. Why do you feel like you got funded out there compared to here? So Chicago's culture, right? Like, you know how every city has a culture. Mm -hmm. So in BC, it's the same. The Midwest is a little bit more slow, a little bit more conservative, right? But how do you even find your VCs? Ah, uh, yeah. Give me the needy gritty, man. Don't no, you trying to hold out. No, so no, that's no, what I'm saying. Not... Like, if somebody has a, an uh -huh. business idea, like, how do you even know how to get to a venture capitalist? Or what even does mm -hmm. that even mean? Or like, what programs, like, what are you Googling to like, look up? Or what, what information does somebody need right. that they wouldn't know? So the biggest thing first is you have to get plugged into some sort of tech community. Okay. So like 1871 was that for me. Okay, it's what is like, 18, I don't know what 1871 is. Yeah, so downtown Chicago, we have 1871. Okay. And essentially it's like a tech incubator. So people who are trying to start companies will go oh, there. Okay. Uh, and you can meet with mentors. You okay. can like have your team meet there, work together. You can get inspired by other founders mm. who are working out of space. So think of it as like an ecosystem. Okay. A physical ecosystem that you could tap into. Okay. And that's how you start to get connections. Mm. And even if Chicago's not gonna give you money, people who are in Chicago know people who will give you money. money. Okay. So it's networking. You still have to network in your local community to get access to other tech hubs and ecosystems. And then that led you to New York. Yeah. Okay. Because this guy named Tony Wilkins, shout out to Tony. Um, he's a Chicago VC, involved a lot with the University of Chicago. He went to Booth. And he was like, hey, my son actually is a partner in this fund. Mm. They're based in LA and New York. You should apply. And, and that kicked apply. it all off. Okay. Yeah. All right. So after you raise your first million and a half, mm -hmm. okay, what do you do with money you raise? Or like, what, what does that look like? And then, I think my next question is like, mm -hmm. are you giving away equity or what are you giving away to raise this money? Or are people giving it to you just because or like, how does that work? Yeah, so you're giving away equity. Okay. Um, there are things such as like non-dilutive capital, which means yeah, just... a gift almost. Like here's 100K, I don't take any equity. It's like Google, for instance, has like the Black Founders Fund. Okay. Latino Founders Fund. They give you like 150k, non diluta So they just want to support. Then you don't have to pay it back. You don't have to do nothing. No, nope, it's a grant. Okay, okay, it's a grant. Okay. And they just give it to you. Okay. So there's really great things out there like that. But for our round that we raised, yeah, it was for equity in the business. Okay. And so now you raise a million in that. What do you do with that money? Or how does that work to expand your company? Like, where do you put the money that you've raised? Yes, yeah, so then you have to strategically think about how am I going to get to the next milestone with this cash? That's what it's all about. Okay. So if you're raising a pre-seed, you have to say, well, how am I going to go from a company that has like no revenue, that basically means you have no revenue, okay. no real traction, to seed, right. meaning you have some sort of revenue. So typically around a seed, you're making at least 500K mm. in annual recurring revenue. Okay. Then from there, the next milestone is the Series A, which you call the graduation rate. You make it there. You've, you've done a really great job because you so found much product market that? fit. That's about, it used to be a million, now it's like a million and a half. Okay. So once you make it to there, 
you found a repeatable customer, reliable revenue that you know how to go and get and capture in the market. Okay. And so you got this money. Mm -hmm. So who was your first couple of customers or like how did, okay, so what happened? Yeah, so when we first went about getting customers, we had an idea, right? Like I told you, I got it at Ernst & Young, but we're not gonna go after EY for our first customer, right? We're brand new. They're huge, they're a behemoth. So we're like, okay, we have to do some sort of test, some sort of beta right. with other clients. So we said, let's test universities, accelerators, and companies, okay. right? Because we said they all have events. All right, before you continue, uh -huh. so before you have this seed round, how are you supporting yourself in general? Like, are you still working or are you still like, how does that work as while you're still trying to build this business? Right. How are you taking care of self? So. Like financially. Like, yeah, that's why I say like, learn on someone else's dime. Mm -hmm. Don't just quit your day job. Right. So for me, I had quit right before we got into that program. Okay. But I saved up enough and I knew like, we're going to get something. Okay. So then when we got into that program, that was only like 150K. Okay. To start in funding. For the New York one. Right. Okay. So still paid ourselves nothing. Okay. Because I was like, we need to use this money to get to that next stage okay. to raise a full pre-seed round. Okay. So we needed to build a product. We needed to get at least one or two beta customers. Yeah. To prove, yes, like you works. should give us the money. Okay. So who was your first customer? Who did you who did you get? So our first customer was the University of Chicago. Okay. We worked with their diversity and inclusion department, which was so cool. And they really wanted some sort of technology to help them with their student diversity and inclusion programs. So they were like, hey, we're getting feedback that our programs could be better, but we don't know what's wrong. And also we don't know how to get them to know and market what we're doing. Right, so how do you even go in and try to get them as a customer? Like, who are you setting up a meeting with, your IT department? Like, what is that, what, I don't even know what that looks like. Yeah, so we got an intro into the director of diversity and inclusion. Okay. And we pitched it to her and she was like, yes, like, we could use this. And then when you find your internal champion, they call it. Okay. You use your internal champion, you partner with them, to get connected to IT, to legal, to procurement. Okay. So that's how we did that. Uh, you got your first customer. Okay. How does that work? How did that go? So there were things that went really well. There were things that didn't work so well. Okay. So I mean, imagine you built a product for the first time. You brought on a customer for the first time. Yeah. You have no idea what could go wrong. Right. So I'll never forget like we were doing the implementation and we were like, okay, everyone sign on, you know? So we were doing an in-person implementation. We literally had like a bug, which means like something that was broken in the platform Yeah. on a sign-in page. So people couldn't even get signed in. Oh, wow. It was like, we had tested everything. Except? Except for the sign-in page. Oh, wow. So like everything inside the platform was working, but the one thing they needed to get into the platform. Okay. Terrible. So. Of course, we're like scrambling, and then we're like, okay, we're going to get it fixed, we're going to get it fixed. Okay. And then when we got it fixed, they were able to get it on, but it was how, how hella long, embarrassing. How long? Okay, one is like, how did you find your coders mm -hmm. to make it? Because you don't code, right? I mean, have I built an app before? Yes. Okay. Should I build apps? No. no. Okay. <laughs> so how, how did you find the person to develop your whole idea come through, and how long did it actually take to to fix that problem. Cause I know once you build an app, you might keep them on uh, mm -hmm. retention or whatever it is, or yeah. Yeah, retainer. Um, so yeah, so when, how much did that even app cost to even bring <laughs> your stuff alive? And then how long did it take to fix that problem? So a lot of people have different opinions right. on how you should go about building your first app. Right. Some people use no code, which is super, super popular, meaning there's platforms where you don't need a developer, it's like Squarespace, drag and drop. Drag and right? drop. Whereas before you need a developer to make your website. Okay. So there's no code platforms. One of our competitors used a no code platform okay. to get to like their first stage, which I think was really smart. For us at that time, no code wasn't really a thing yet. Right, it wasn't around, right? No. All right. So my biggest thing is also, second, I wouldn't recommend outsourcing your talent overseas. Right. I have done that 
and that was more costly yeah. to fix than it was to have. Okay. It's just the quality sometimes not there, the speed sometimes not there, and you're just like shelling out, printing out cash right. for little to no results. Right. So what I recommend is you network your butt off to find a technical co-founder or technical founding member. And that's what I did. Okay. What's so it? how I do it? Yeah. Like. I mean, you know I talk a lot. Exactly. No shit. <laughs> that's why we're here. Keep wow. Going. Root. So I literally went to like lots of networking events. Mm. My first founding team member who was technical, I just had knew like through the tech scene and I remember pitching them, you know? Like, hey, this it's is like mine. dates. Yeah. It's like, yeah. hey, you're courting. Like, hey, you want to come work with me? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm right. like, it'll be great. Like, this is what we're doing. And what finally convinced him was when we got our first investor. Mm. Yeah, and when we like, moved to New York. Okay. Yeah. That's when he came in. That's good. It cost a lot to build his first app? I mean, so we were all not getting paid at first. Right. And to get our first version up, he literally built it in probably four weeks. It was something insane. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. We called him um, Red Bull because he would just like hit a Red Bull and cold all day, crazy. all night. That's wild. Yeah. Okay, so how long did it take to fix that sign-in problem? And he was the person that was still making this at this time? Or right. did you have more technical people? It was just, just him. him. Okay. It was just him. Put the whole team on his back. And uh, to fix that problem, that took like less than an hour. Okay. It was pretty quick. It was just more of like an oversight. Okay. Is he still on your team? No. No? No. Oh, wow. Are you, is UIC still... Uh, you of Chicago? No, you're, you're, you're of Chicago. Still a customer? No. No. Okay, come on. So... We ended up working with a completely different customer type. Oh, wow. So we didn't pick universities, we picked companies. Okay, Because yeah. they had the most budget and the most need. And then in terms of like team, one thing I'll tell people all the time is some of the people you start with, and they're not, they're gonna, not gonna be the people you finish with. And that's not a bad thing at all, right? Yeah. Even in life, yeah. we experience that. There's people who come into your life yeah. who maybe were just there for a season. Right. And that's okay. Yeah. So it's learning, like you don't take anything personally. Yeah. It's like, what's for you is for you. And if it's no longer for you, it's no longer for you, right? right? Makes sense. Right there. Okay. Um, where are we at? You raised your first million and a half, right? right. You had your first customer. Yeah. All right. And this year was what? What year is this? We're in, oh, that, that was 2019. Okay. And then so how does that progress? What happens? So 2019 going into 2020. Wait, wait. What did you, where did you go to college? What did you, is that what you studied in college? Like tech? I was an accounting major. I was too, and then I switched. Really? I switched my senior year. I could totally see you being an accountant. I went in. I went in. I was good with numbers, but after that, that wasn't about numbers. That was too many processes. In my senior year, I transferred or I, I switched majors uh -huh. to kinesiology, and uh, I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll do this instead. Yeah, you're Virgo self. I could totally see yeah, you being no. like, let no, me fuck, do fuck like this. how you solved that math problem yeah, for me on how old I was. He was fucking up. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay. But so, what college you go to? Huh? Notre Dame, undergrad. Okay. And I got my MBA from U Chicago at Booth. Okay. So all Midwest. What so then from there, we go into demo day for the program. So we did that program where we flew, moved to New York, got 150. Yep. So demo day is legit three months later. You are to get in front of an audience of people who have money. Oh, this is when you start your pitching and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Pitching. Okay. Potential customers. And you have to get up there and tell them how you were able to super grow in 90 days. Okay. How you were able to bring on customers, make revenue, have a product. So we got up there, we had, I think at the time, it was like three customers. Okay. We had made some money, we had a product, and we were like, okay, now we're looking to fundraise. Okay. And that kicked off our fundraise process. And I ended up staying in New York for another like nine months after that oh, to wow. okay. finish it. And why? Because Morgan Stanley ended up coming in and investing. That's what's up. I know okay. it was it was literally a huge win for us because it's Morgan Stanley, great brand. Oh, for sure. And then we were able to work out of their office space. Okay. Oh, but nice. it was funny because we're like startup founders, In wearing Morgan like our Stanley all black. Suits. We look yeah. like you, right? Exactly. We're in all black, uh, t-shirt, jeans. But then you're going in as bankers, right? So they're like fully suited up all the time, looking right. at us like, "What are fuck y'all? Fuck y'all doing here?" Yeah, exactly. They robbing the place. Okay. Yeah. Go so, good. Huh? Continue. So from there. I just network, network, network. The Morgan Stanley money got us like <clears throat> to almost half of our goal. And then from there, we were able to get other funds to come in. 
So you basically, you're the salesperson for your product. You just go in and talk to companies, tell them what yeah. it is. Do fundraising, sales. Okay. Yeah. So continue. Right. What, year, what year is this? So this is going into 2020. Okay. And then the decision came to either stay in New York. Okay. Try to move to maybe California. Okay. To the Bay. Or to come back to Chicago. Okay, and obviously you're here. So how did that decision come about? Why did you choose Chicago? I mean, I'm bullish on Chicago. In yeah. a sense of being a black woman from the Midwest, knowing that only nine black founders yeah. have raised over a million. Is that still, are you 10? Are you 10? I mean, now we might be at like 20, 12 30? max. Oh, okay. No, not even. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, funding for black founders since George Floyd has actually gone down. Oh, wow. We thought it would have gone up. It's actually gone down. Oh, wow. So, I wanted to come back to Chicago because I believe that the only way that we get more black folks funded is have more black exits. Mm. So people who get their company acquired yeah. or who like blow up to IPO, right? But we just need more examples of black founders doing it here okay. to get more black founders cash. Okay. So, okay, so it's 2020, you decide to come back here. Yeah. Then what? Came back here and we had a whole pandemic. Yep. We had a whole pandemic. So think, we were growing, 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 growing. Boom. Pandemic hits. 90% of the contracts we were about to close in our oh. pipeline, gone. Okay. So imagine, it's like super speed growth to almost like a screeching Stop. halt, like nothing. And we had just raised all this money. So for me, it was like, okay, what are we going to do? We got to this point and now who's having events? Right in a pandemic, right? nobody. So what I always say you have to do if you ever run into a block like that is you need to get really close to your customer. Okay. Like real close. It's like pillow talk. Yeah. Tell, tell me, <laughs> tell me your deepest problem. I hate you so much. What, what's going on? Talk to yeah, you, yeah. right? But it's true. I believe it, okay. Because what are they gonna tell you? Yeah. They're gonna tell you their greatest pain points and those are things that you can build and solve for. Mm. So what I learned was, Okay. Okay, you're no longer doing in-person events, but at some point, once things stabilize, you still want to connect your talent because you know a connected workforce is a more engaged and more productive one. Okay. You know that your retention is better when your employees feel connected. Okay. So we started interviewing people and found that they were trying to do virtual events. Exactly. So we started building out all these capabilities mm. for virtual events. Okay, so that goes to my next question of, are you still working with the same person tech-wise, or how did you go? Like, who? What's the like? What's the next tech person that the tech person that works for you, or how does that work? Yeah, so I end up recruiting this other guy. Okay. Who had worked in startups before? This was right before the pandemic. Okay. And he came on with us, and he okay. was like really good technically, understood what we needed to do. He was a great, what we call zero to one person. Okay. So you have zero to one people, one to 100 people. Zero, zero to one people can take it from idea to, to some life. sort of beta, some sort of product. The one to 100 people are like the people who can scale it into something that's massive, right? Okay. But he was a great zero to one guy. So that's what he did for us. Okay. So the pandemic hit. You had to get real close to your customers. You start building in new stuff into your app product. Then what happens? So wait. So at here, did you raise more money at this point, or like, like, were you? Are you still always raising money? Like, how does that work? So it's in seasons. Okay. Um, of milestones. So we had just raised the pre-seed. Okay. So we had to reach our next milestone, mm -hmm. which is the seed. Okay. Which means like, hey, the revenue isn't like super consistent, repeatable, but we figured something out to an extent to where if we get more capital, we think we can get to a product market fit. Okay. And some sort of reliability. Okay. And cash flow. Um, so since we had just closed our round right before that, we were good cash wise, but your whole goal after you finish fundraising it's to like put the pedal to the metal, right? It's just to get customers. So obviously it was hard to do in a pandemic, but since we were close to our customer, when we heard, hey, we're doing virtual events now, yeah. our platform was ready. 
because we were building that in that downtime we had. We were building both virtual events and we were doing just consulting. Okay. Just to bring revenue in. It wasn't like our core offering. Right. But we were like, hey, we'll, we'll learn more about your company. We can give you recommendations. And that both helped our product and it helped our customer. Mm, okay. And it gave us cash in the meantime. Okay. So that's what we did. During the pandemic. Right. Okay. And then when things opened up in the pandemic, we grew like 20x. Why is that? Why do you feel like that is? It was because companies were saying, we have no way to operationalize connecting our employees virtually across like the globe. We need a software to do it. And you guys. To do. make it better. And we had that. That's what's up. So we grew crazy fast, brought on all these customers. And then we were able to close our seed round, which was 4.25 million. Nice. And I in, did that in 21. In 21. Yeah. Right. Um, who were your, were they VCs or just like, were they bigger companies or are they more like individual venture capitalists or who else ended up getting? And yeah. is Morgan Stanley still a part of your stuff? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah okay. they are. Okay. So Slack, if you're familiar yeah, with yeah, Slack yeah. and Salesforce, oh, wow. they came in. Oh, really? It was cool. That's that what's was, up. That was dope. Okay. Yeah. And that was like a huge win for us because Slack. Don't they have their own type of thing almost? Yeah, because we integrate into Slack. Ah, that, okay. So it was a really great, because a lot of our uh, customers use Slack for employee communication. Okay. So since internal events and communications works together, we integrate into the product to help communicate the, the offerings, the internal events. Okay. Yeah. So they came in, Use Chicago um, came in, and then a whole bunch of other um, angels came in. Black Ops VC, they're a black-led um, firm that gives like the like the, they lead rounds for seed and series A uh, black founded companies. Okay. Definitely look into them. Okay. And then Cleveland Avenue, which is Donald Thompson's fund. Basically he was a former CEO, black CEO of McDonald's. Okay. Came in as well. That's so, what's up. Imagine like we had our best year yet. And this is you pitching to everybody. Right. This is you doing. This is me. This is you, okay. This is me. Okay, there you go. So as a little girl, I always talked a lot, but <laughs> I, I tell my parents, it Thank paid, you. It right. Oh, God. It paid Thank off. Thank you. It, it paid, paid off. off, right? So how do those speaking skills, where did you learn it? Like, how did you how did you become this person to pitch, to sell? Because obviously, I mean, obviously you could talk about you winning a lot of stuff, right? We always talk yeah. about you winning these pitch competitions, mm -hmm. things like that. Like, where does that skill come from? How does that confidence, like, talk about that? Yeah, I've won, like, over a quarter of a million in just pitch competitions. Okay. And so how do you prepare for that? How did you get prepared for that? Like, yeah. things like that. The biggest thing, I'll never forget, like when I was a little girl, um, I was maybe like fourth, fifth grade. And I went to a Catholic school. So in the chapel, they had like every year this dedication to MLK. And I remember a little boy would go up and he would do the speech for MLK. And I remember saying, I wanted to do the speech that year. Yeah. I was like, I want to do it. And I was the little girl who got up there, I wore a suit jacket. Oh, wow. Put on one of my dad's ties. Okay. And I gave the I have a dream speech and I was so excited to do it. Okay. But the thing that I tell anybody who wants to pitch, who wants to get out there, is you have to know how to tell a story. Okay. You have to be an amazing storyteller. You think about MLK, what was he? He was a phenomenal storyteller. Right. He knew how to connect to the masses. He knew how to use words, right? Yeah. For people to understand his vision. Right. So it's not only being a good storyteller, but be able to connect people to a vision right. and rally them around it. That's what being a founder is. Now, do you feel like that was something you learned or is that something that you feel like is just a talent that you have? Both. Okay. I've always been good at talking. Yep. But what you also you? have to learn how to do that shit concise. And so how did you learn that? Or what, what skills did you learn? Like classes, like mm -hmm. masterminds? Like how do, you, how do you do that? You watch the best. Okay. And who did you look at? Well, one person who I love is Arlen Hamilton. Okay. She like literally raised her own fund. She was homeless, slept in the airport, raised her own fund from being homeless in the airport with a laptop. Right. But she learned how to be a great, effective storyteller, pitching to these billionaire VCs out okay. in the back. Okay. And it's like when people say, oh, I can't do it because I don't have the resources or I don't have the connections. It's more like you didn't go try to figure out what resources you can acquire, or what connections you can make with what you had in the, in the God-given ability that you already acquired. Right. So watching her tell her story for me was one of the most in inspiring. Definitely, she's a black woman, yeah. and I like see myself in her. 
Right. Right. Okay. And so you get all this, right? 2021, mm -hmm. you, your company goes 20X. And this is what? 2022, 2021 still? So 2020 going into 21, because 21 was when I closed the round. Okay. The 4.2. Yeah. Right. 4.25. Okay. And then we fast forward into last year. Okay. The worst year of my business. Really? Yeah, okay, I was okay. ready to get to that. The worst okay. year. Okay. So what what's your annual revenue? Are you still making a, the revenue when you had your seed? What would that look like? Yeah. So when we got to our seed, we were north of that um, half a million mark. We were of revenue. Right. We were north okay, of that. Okay. We saw some contraction last year. Okay. The year where all the tech layoffs were happening. Mm. So like post COVID, you see a contraction in the market. And I don't know if you you remember like all the companies just laying off their employees. Oh yeah, for sure, because Facebook, because they had hired so many people during COVID that they mm -hmm. had to let all those people go that they just brought on. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. So now we see in all of our customers, some of the people that we're selling to that were our main customer no longer have a job. Or they had a team oh, of wow. five and now they're a team of one. Right, right, right. So we're like, what in budgets had just froze? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are like, we can't spend money because yeah. budgets are frozen. So we're now just getting back to in this year. This year. Budgets are opening again. Okay. But so, we still see some residual layoffs happening. Okay. So what did that worst year look like? What is that? Mm -hmm. So for us, it was some of our clients didn't renew. Yeah. Um, what well, you know? What were the reasons for that? Or just because of the budgets, most likely. Budget. Yeah. Okay. They they finance one sign off. I know one of our customers, which was our favorite customer, passed away. Ah. Uh, it was just one of those years that made me question, God, is this what you want me to be doing? Okay, why is that? Like, how bad does it have to get for you to question that? It was everything from team members who were with us that are no longer with us, customers yeah. who have been with us for years that are no longer with us, um, and thinking that we were going to be at that past the million mark, oh, because that's revenue. what we were tracking towards okay. to raise that A, our graduation rate, right. to then say, we're gonna to have to wait probably one more year. Okay. So that's why I was like, God gives you a vision and he tells you to execute and he brings these things around you to help you get there. But when you're in your lowest of your low, you start to ask yourself, God, is this still for me? Right. And the thing is, is yes. Yeah. It is. All right. It is. Well, because some people, again, I get it, because some people look at it twofold, right? Yeah. Like, oh, God doesn't want me to have this, so right. I'm going to stop. Or is it that brick uh -huh. wall that God is telling you to push you through? And I always, always have a question mm -hmm. with that. But go ahead, continue. Uh -huh. So last year. Right. Yeah. So what I realized God was telling me, it was God had to remove some things from my life last year. Okay. Things that for the longest I had held on to. Okay because I wasn't ready to let go of them. I thought, God, I can do it. I don't, we don't have to let go of these things. We yeah. can, everyone can win yeah. like this. But it was at the sacrifice of myself. And right. when God's trying to elevate you, right. sometimes he has to take things from you. And it right. may feel like, why are you taking that from me? Right. But it's to push you to the next level, it's to deepen your faith. Yeah. It's to have you lean on him more, to, to realize that you making it through this, it wasn't you. Yeah, it, it was, was not you. It yeah. was him For right sure. yeah. so that's where i'm at right now it's like this crazy faith season of all right lord i'm just going to trust you yeah. all right I, I don't have all the answers but i'm going to trust you right. and i'm going to show up yeah but that's that's what i got right now okay and then so this year what does it look like or how is what, what, what are we looking at what are the projections what is what is everything how, how is it all going so the plan is Right now, the Series A market is in the shitter. Okay. That's what all my VC mentors have told me, other founders have told me, for even founders who are hitting that north of a million mark, yeah. having a hard time. Okay. Because the market is still, you know, markets Up go like yeah. this. Yeah. So right now, it's not here. It's, it's still yeah. trying to, to get back up here. So the plan is to grow revenue, to do what they call a bridge. Okay. Which is like a seed, extension okay so it's like 
you're doing another seed, but you're just adding more money onto that pot okay. of what you were already raising from, right. instead of trying to push to the next level. Okay. So we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna wait till next year to go for the next one, the A, so, and seeing where the market's at. Because you also, you could go out and do an A right now, Right. but this thing called your valuation on what you would sell it for. Yeah. Uh, so is that is that the goal for you eventually? All right. You wanna you wanna give away equity when your valuation is higher versus lower. And so right? what is your company valued at right now? Ooh, do I want to share that online? Yeah. <laughs> Enough. It's a yeah, big it's, number. It's a good valuation. Right. We got a really good valuation okay. at our seat. And but you're not but not a big enough to sell. Right. But the thing is with the valuation we got at our seed, if I were to go right now and try to raise at an A, yeah. we would have to bring it down because of where the market is currently. Ah, That's why you have to be careful when you raise, Okay. because it could dictate what you have to sell for. Are you waiting for a certain number to sell? <laughs> if there's I mean, a certain number like, oh yeah, I can get out here, would you? The answer for me is maybe. Okay. I think it's twofold. One. Did you, did you go into this wanting to sell this or you just went in just like, hey, I'm just gonna do yeah, this? Yeah, it was, I went into it because I felt that this is where God was pushing me to go. Right. And I and I was excited about that, and right. I still am. So for me to sell, it's really like, well, what does God say? Right. Like, yes, like I'm involved in that, but like also what does God say? Like, right. what is he ultimately trying to do through me with this company? Right. And if that sell would be the thing that, like I said, could create more money and capital yeah. for black founders in the Midwest, yeah. or black founders, period. You to me, that's the win. Okay. You know? That makes sense. All right, two more things I want to touch on before we get out of here is one, how does the gym help you in your busy schedule and what importance does it play in your life? And then two is what would you tell somebody in your position or what advice do you want to give somebody that might be thinking of doing a startup or, you know, <laughs> if you talk to yourself, you know, 10 years ago, right? Ooh. So the gym for me, is release. Okay. It's catharsis. It's um, an ability to clear my head, to connect with God and myself, okay. to build confidence, and to show that whatever I put my mind to, I could do it. Right. Um, and also, Hector's a great therapist. Oh, he's so funny. Uh. <laughs> great dating coach, great therapist. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, I do it all. I'm like, Hector's Hitch. helping hands. There you go. I'm like, this. Uh, and so what, what weight did you start at when you first started? She uh, don't want to fucking put up her, her before and after pictures yet, but go ahead. You can tell the people. Ooh. <laughs> you can talk. Ah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Like over okay, a Okay, how much, how much have we lost? Okay. How, okay, let's go with that number. Yeah, let's because you're going to do too much. I mean, how much have I lost? At least. I've probably lost like 25 at least. Okay. Maybe 30. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but you know. Something like that. She'll soon show her. Yeah. Befores and afters. Okay. So uh, good things. Good progress. Yes. All right. Uh-huh. So now t talk to yourself 10 years ago. What advice do you give somebody that's trying to start out as you? Maybe, you know, a black yeah. woman that wants to do everything that you do. What, what do you tell them? Obviously, it's harder because obviously the numbers that you spewed out. What do you, right. what do you tell somebody or how do you, what advice would you give them? I love that. Um, I think one thing I would tell folks is to read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. There's this one agreement that he has of the four that I constantly kind of refresh in my head. Which is what? The agreement is don't take things personally. Okay. As a startup founder, you're going to receive so many no's. But you have to understand that some of those no's are not yet. Right? So if you were to take it personally and said, oh, that investor told me no, that customer told me no, maybe what they're really telling you is not yet. Hey, first, go sell one more customer, then come back to me. Right. Or hey, once you get this integration, let's connect again in six months, right? Or hey, we don't have the budget right now. Let's talk next year. If you take things personally and you look at all this rejection as no's instead of as a form of feedback, then you're denying yourself the ability to get better and to know what in your process you can improve on to make that a yes next time. Okay. So that's all I say. It's like, 
don't take things personally. Some people are going to want to work for you. Some people are going to quit. They're going to want to go do something else. Right. Some customers are going to pay you and then they're going to say, we're not paying you anymore. And if you want to get butthurt about it and internalize that, it's not going to get you anywhere. So that's all I'll say. Don't, don't take things personally. Good. Any other notes that you want to leave on? Anything you want to tell the people before we get out of here? The biggest thing I would say is um, for men, for women, know your self-worth, period. That's the biggest thing you can have is self-respect, self-love, and understanding that people will treat you how you allow them to. Mm -hmm. So honor, honor thyself. That's what I got. Good. Say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.